Good morning, everybody. I'm excited to be here with you. Excited to have our chairs here. These are actually Clive's chairs. Uh, when we inquired about using this space, the West Pine Community School District uh, sent a message to the principal, and the principal got back to us and said, well, we, we'd love to have a church here, but we don't have very nice chairs or very many, and so we offered to buy them chairs, and so they, these have been on a long journey, and they got delivered to the wrong place a few times. That's why they're here week three, but we're excited just to partner with Clive School to bless them, and these are more comfortable than the ones we sat on last week, so it's a good day. Um, We've been kicking off this, this new church, Revision Church, with this series called Revision, where we're taking a look at some of the most important areas and aspects of our lives, which are also very frequently areas of stress and concern and frustration for us. We've talked about faith, and, and we've talked about relationships, and we're going to talk about parenting and, and family, and we're talking about work, but this morning, I want to talk about a really important one. This morning I want to talk about success, because I think every one of us in this room has dreams. We all have a vision of what we want our life to be. We all have a picture of, of what we want to achieve in this life, of who we want to be known as, of, of the glory and the honor and the, and the success that we want to accomplish, but pursuing success is frequently in our culture and in our nation a source of deep angst and a source of deep frustration and, and even depression. Sometimes, because we have this picture in our minds what we want our lives to turn out like, and then we look at our lives and they don't look a lot like that picture so frequently. And what I want to do this morning is talk about success. And I want to kind of turn our culture and our world's picture of what success is and what it ought to be on its head. I want to give you a bigger, better vision of what your future can and should look like in this area of pursuing success. And specifically, I want to talk about pursuing it. Through, through this one idea, this one concept. Now we might set record high temperatures today, but if you look around at the leaves and the trees, you see them falling, and, and we know that it's fall, and so I want to talk about, in the name of changing of the seasons, uh, I want to talk about humility, because pride and summertime come before a fall. That's as good as the jokes get, uh, it's downhill from here. Uh, my son Jimmy turned six uh, just a few months ago, which is like not long for me to have a six-year-old kid, but I decided upon the occasion of his sixth birthday to ask him, now that he's big, if he has any idea what he wants to do with his life, what he wants to be when he grows up, and, and he looked at me and said, yeah, dad, uh, when I grow up, I think I want to be a pastor or a doctor. Yes. Like, we are doing something right as parents, it's like, I love it, be a doctor. I need someone to pay for me when I get old. But like, you're thinking like, all right, I've done something, something good. And then a few seconds later, he looked up at me and said, we're a dancer. <laughs> but he got me thinking as I was talking to my own six-year-old kid, like, what did I want to be when I was his age? And, and I know that when I was six years old, there was one thing that I wanted to be, and it was not a dancer. I wanted to be a major league baseball player. Or more specifically, I wanted to be Ryan Sandberg. He was the all-star second baseman for the Chicago Cubs, and he was my hero. 23 was my lucky number. I chose to play second base every time I could, even in kickball. I just wanted to be great like Rhino. He was everything that I wanted to be. I dreamed of being great like Ryan Sam. I did not dream a lot as a little kid about being humble. I don't think most of us do. Like when we're small and we kind of picture what we want to be when we get big, what we want to be when we grow up. We don't have a lot of dreams coursing through our veins about how we're going to serve everybody and, and, and be humble. We dream about being great. We dream about being awesome. And I think as we grow up, we don't all of a sudden start to dream about being humble. Like when we get into school and we dream about achieving and, and who we want to be and what we want to accomplish and how we want to get good grades, what we want to do extracurricularly. And we dream about achievement and greatness and not humility. And then we move on to college, we dream about what college we're going to go to, and what major we're going to choose, and what career path we're going to have, and we dream about how we're going to get the most money for ourselves, and achieve this success the way the world defines it, and we don't really dream about how we're going to serve the people around us. And then we graduate college, we get into the real world, and we start to climb the social ladders, and, and the work ladders that we, that we want to climb, and we don't dream a whole lot about how to be humble as we're doing that. We respect humility, we admire humility, we desire greatness. We dream about glory and honor and recognition and fame and power. This is the stuff of our dreams. 
And we look around us and we see plenty of evidence in our world that the way to get that stuff, the way to achieve glory and success and honor and power is pride and arrogance and a willingness to trample anybody who gets in the way. Anybody who gets in the way of our dreams. And sometimes we witness that firsthand because we are the ones being trampled. And our inner pragmatist looks at our world and looks at our own experiences and says, well, maybe that's the way. Maybe if I really want to achieve success, maybe if I really want to be all that I dreamed that I could be, if I really want to be great and, and I really want to be honored, maybe I just need to be arrogant. Maybe I need to be proud. Maybe I need to be willing to trample anybody and everybody who gets in the way of my dreams. You know, when in Rome. And it's hard in the midst of this culture not to be self-centered. It is hard in the midst of the world in which we're living not to be full of pride. Because this world tells us that that's the way to achieving the meaning and the significance and the honor and the success that something deep inside of every one of us longs for. But what if that's not the way? I'm not here this morning to tell you to stop dreaming about the on the contrary, I think it's hardwired into us as human beings to desire lives of meaning and significance, to, to dream about lives that, that make a difference and change the world and, and do something great. I think that's just a part of what it means to be human. We want to live lives that make an impact on the people around us. What I want to do this morning is challenge the cultural narrative of how we get there. What I want to do this morning is challenge the picture that our world paints of what greatness and honor and success Really are. I want to take a look at what God has to say about who He is and who He created us to be so that we can connect the dots between the people we long to be and the journey it's going to take us to get there. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, or if you have your phones, go ahead and open them up to Proverbs. It's right in the middle. If you don't have them, don't worry, the words are on the screen. If you don't own a Bible, we have some in the back. Take one home. Read it. It's good stuff. But the Proverbs, it's right in the middle. And they're these wise sayings. And we're going to read three of them right in a row. We're going to start in Proverbs chapter 15. Proverbs 15 verse 33 says this. Wisdom's instruction is to fear the Lord. And humility comes before honor. You flip the next chapter. Proverbs 16 18 says pride goes before destruction. A haughty spirit before a fall. And two chapters later, chapter 18, Proverbs number 12 says... Before a downfall, the heart is haughty, but humility comes before honor. And this idea isn't just one that occurs in a few Proverbs. It occurs over and over and over again throughout Scripture in the New Testament. James chapter 4, verse 6 says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. God just hammers this home throughout the Bible. He hammers it home in His words, in the words of the prophets, in the words of the wisdom writers, in the lives of the characters. What we see is that, that God constantly, and understand, this is a stayed mindset for God. It isn't just a decision he makes on a case-by-case -case basis. What we see is that God constantly stands in opposition to the proud and in solidarity with the humble. The great church father, Augustine, once wrote this, There is scarcely a page in the holy books which does not resound the words that God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. If you should ask me what were the ways of God, I would tell you that the first is humility. The second is humility, and the third is humility. Humility is the foundation of all the other virtues. Hence, in the soul in which this virtue does not exist, there cannot be any other virtue except mere appearance. Humility is near to the heart of God, and pride is far from it. So I think the question it begs for us is, what does that look like then? What does humility look like and what does pride look like in the middle of a self-centered culture that teaches us that, that, that pride and arrogance are the way to go about getting what we want? That they're the pathway to success. Like, how do we know when we're being proud? How do we know when we're being humble? Well, the good news is that, that pride and humility in the middle of our culture don't have to exist as some, like, far-off, ethereal concept to us because we have a phenomenal example of exactly what God is talking about in the life of Jesus Christ. Jesus lives it out for us and provides us with a really clear picture of what God means when he talks about humility, of what God means when he talks about living a life of sacrifice. And Paul talks about that in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. Paul writes about, about Jesus and how he is an example of how we ought to live. He writes this, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he 
He made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Paul paints this incredible word picture of what Jesus did when he came down and when he became a man. He uses this, this phrase, he made himself nothing. He made himself nothing. And in Greek, this is just one word. It means empty. It's this word kenosis. Everybody say kenosis with me. Kenosis. Now we know Greek. But it's this word kenosis it means empty. But what Paul's saying Jesus did, he just said, Jesus made himself nothing. Jesus emptied. He said Jesus emptied himself. He allowed himself to be poured out of the life that he was living into the shape of a different life. Let me illustrate. I have this Gatorade here. I have a cup. And any sort of illustration is going to break down quickly. But for the purposes of this analogy, Jesus is the Gatorade, right? And Jesus is, is Gatorade, and he's living a Gatorade. The Gatorade here is living a Gatorade-shaped life. It's in a Gatorade body. And before Jesus came down, he was God living a God-shaped life. He was in heaven with all the angels. He's living the life that God should live. But when Paul says, when Paul uses the word kenosis, empty, poured out, became nothing, what he's saying is that, that Jesus allowed himself to be poured out. Poured out of the shape of the life that he was living into the shape of a different life. Like if I pour this Gatorade out, it's, it's living a Gatorade-shaped life in a Gatorade-shaped bottle. And now the shape is fundamentally different. The essence is the same. It's still fruit punch Gatorade, right? Nothing changed about what it is, but everything changed about the shape of its existence. And what Paul's saying here that Jesus did is that he allowed himself to be poured out of his God-shaped existence into a different existence, into the shape of the vision of the life that the Father had for him. He emptied himself into a different vision, into a different life. There's something critical we got to understand about that, because I think sometimes our theology betrays us. This thing we call the incarnation, Jesus coming down and becoming a man. Sometimes we think that that's something he did over and against his divinity. We think that, like, Jesus and the Father, they were up in heaven, and then Jesus decided, well, I'm going to do something different, something completely new. And then he rejected that. So we have this picture of Christ on earth, like, Jesus is, is over here, he's serving, and he's humble, and then God is up, like, the Father's up here, and he's, and he's still holy and sovereign in and, and, and all of his glory. And then when Jesus came, and he served, and he loved, and he gave of himself, and he died on the cross, he was doing something in contrast to his divinity. And I want us to understand that, that he wasn't. That even though God becoming man was new, like that had never happened before in the history of the world, that was new. Jesus wasn't doing something totally new when he came to earth when he humbled himself. He was living out the character of God. Everything that God does comes from the character of God. So when we see Jesus serving the poor, when we see Jesus healing the broken, when we see Jesus loving the lost, it isn't new. It isn't something he decided to do in contrast to his holiness, in contrast to his divinity, in contrast to his power, his sovereignty, it's something he did out of that. So in Jesus, we have this picture of a humble servant who gave himself to and gave his life for the people around him. And what that is is a picture and a reminder for us that God is and has always been a God of humility. Ready to give himself for the sake of the world. See, that was a game changer with Jesus. That was a complete game changer with Jesus for the entire world that he was living in. Because up till that point, up to the point that Christ came down and started serving and loving as God, all the conversations in the world about divinity were about power and oppression. The gods of the Greeks and the gods of the Romans were at best reflections of the basis of desires of humanity. And mythology tells us that their deepest desire and their deepest purpose was to gain more power for themselves. And they were willing to trample each other, and they were certainly willing to trample humanity in order to get it. And the tribal gods, the gods of the Norsemen, were much better. They used power and presence as a weapon against those who were beneath them. And then Christ comes along. Christ comes along as God, and he starts to serve, and he starts to give. He humbles himself. He allows himself to be poured out and made nothing for the sake of the world. And that just turned the world upside down. It completely reframed what everyone thought about what greatness looks like, about what power looks like, about what God looks like. And here's why that matters for us. I said it last week. I'm going to say it again and again and again. It matters for us 
is we are created in the image of God. We're shaped to be like Him. So the Bible tells us, right, that God is humility and God is service. That means that humility is hardwired into us as human beings. There's something about being human that requires humility. I think that was a hard one to believe. Like, when I say that, I mean, last week I said there's something hardwired into us about love. And you think, yeah, yeah, I get that. When I say there's something hardwired into you about humility, at least for me, that was a hard one to wrap my mind around. It's like, if humility is really hardwired into me as a human being, if, if that's what it means to be human because I'm created in the image of God, why am I so terrible at it? Not me, personally, you guys. That was a collective eye. I am phenomenal at humility. I'm probably the best at it that I know. It's one of my many talents. But like, if humility is, is hardwired in us as human beings, why are you all so bad at it? Right? We struggle with pride. We struggle with selfishness because we're broken. But I don't think actually, if we stop and think about it, it's that hard to wrap our minds around the idea that humility is hardwired in us. Think of a time, right now, think of a time where you serve somebody else. Where you did community service. Where you just gave of yourself to somebody in need. Think of a time. And think about the feelings and the emotions that went through your heart and your soul and your mind as you were serving, or as you were driving home from serving. I'm willing to bet that most of us in here this morning, as we think about that time, feel like, oh my goodness, I was filled out. I felt more alive when I did that. I felt like more fully human as I was driving home from helping those people. There's a reason that you felt alive. There's a reason you felt human, because you were. Because part of what it means to be human is to give of ourselves to the people around us. That's the way God is, and that's the way God wired us to be. We're wired to serve. That's why Jesus lived the way that he lived. It's why Jesus said some of the stuff that he said. And honestly, he said some crazy stuff. Some really weird, hard, mind-boggling, countercultural stuff. Like one of his disciples, Matthew, wrote this whole book about the life of Jesus and some of the weird stuff that he said. And in chapter 20, Matthew writes down two of the most ridiculously countercultural things that Jesus ever said. Chapter 20, verse 16, Jesus looked at his disciples and this crowd that came to listen to him, and he said this to him, he says, So, the last will be first, and the first will be last. Like, I imagine you're sitting there listening to Jesus say something weird like that. Like, you're going to give him the thumbs up because he's Jesus, right? But deep in your head, you're like, what is he talking about? The last will be first? That doesn't make any sense. Right? And then just a paragraph after that, he says another crazy thing. Right? And here's, here's the setting. One of the disciples, or actually there's a mom of, of two of the disciples. She comes to Jesus and she asks, like, Jesus, can my two sons have a special spot in heaven? I want one on your right and one on your left. And then like, can they have, like, this, this special spot? And then the other disciples hear about it and they get picked off. Moms, right? Embarrassing their kids for over 2,000 years. <laughs> But she just uses his mom thing, and then, and then they get mad, and they start having this debate, like, who actually deserves that spot? Jake and John don't deserve it. They're not as cool as me. I want to sit there. Jesus over here is it. He's like, oh, no, 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 no. I want to tell you about true greatness. And he says this to his disciples, because you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus looks at his disciples and says, hey, check it out. The first are going to be last. If you want to be great, you've got to start by serving everybody around you. I think we're all, we hear that, and we're okay with that a little bit. As long as, like, as, long as we know how long, right? Because Jesus' plan for greatness seems to be like this, this J curve. Right? Like, first, first you just, you gotta serve a little bit. You gotta go down, you gotta humble yourself, so that eventually you can get to the top. And as I hear it, I'm like, I'm, I'm all right with that, as long as I know, like, how many people do I have to serve before they start serving me, and then I'm great and honorable and, and, and wonderful and successful and glorified. Like, there's something, there's this question ringing in our selfish minds. It's like, how long? Okay, Jesus, like, if the first are gonna be last, like, when's, when, or then the last are gonna be first, how long do I have to be last before that, that part where I'm going to be first? Like, how, 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 many, how far down do I have to go to get to the point on the ladder that I want to get to? We want to calculate the return on investment first. We just want to know, like, what's the ROI on this janker? How humble do I have to be in order for it to suit my purposes and, and make me as great 
as I want to be. And we're okay taking this road to humility as long as we know how long we got to be on it and just how far we got to go before we don't have to be humble anymore, before everyone thinks that we're great. I'm okay, right? I'm okay standing in the back of the line, being the guy in the back, and everyone walks around, like, yeah, I got this cool and mine's in the back. Loser. Just as long as I know that, like, pretty soon Jesus is going to pull that trick. He's like, everyone do a 180. No, no, Mike's in the front. Told you so. That's why I stood in the back. Jesus told me. Right? Like, I'm okay being in the back as long as I know pretty soon I'm going to be in the front. But there's this problem. The problem is that Jesus is really confused. He just messes it all up. You see, Jesus, he thinks that the bottom is actually the destination and not the journey. Jesus is somehow convinced that being the servant of all, that pouring yourself out and becoming nothing for the sake of the people around you, is greatness. He's convinced that humility is the finish line and not just an obstacle on the path to the success and glory that we dreamed of. If we're honest, when we hear that something inside of us just recoils a little bit, hear that Jesus doesn't actually want us to make it to the top, he just wants us to get to the bottom. There's something inside of us that says, oh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know about that. That's not the way that I pictured it in my mind. That's not the, the vision that I had for, for my life and, and my boy. That seems like a kind of a harder road. It seems like a little bit more difficult path than, than, I, was, than I was thinking, Jesus, because I, I, I want success, and I want glory, and I want honor, and I want power. And we do, we want power. We all do. If we're honest, we want the ability to do what we want and to make other people do what we want them to do. We do. Wouldn't that be great? I just think, what, what if you had actual power? What if you could do whatever you wanted and you could make everyone else do for you whatever you wanted? I started thinking of this week, like, what would the world be like if I had that power? Or what would the world be like if any of us had that power? Like, how many siblings would be left? Right? Like, how many of you have ever said to a sibling, I wish you would just disappear? I wish you were part of a different family, or I wish you were dead. Anybody? Anybody who hasn't said that is an only child, right? Like, if we had absolute power of God, then there would be no siblings. We'd all be only children. Like, how many bosses would be left? There's a reason that we don't have that kind of power, because we can't be trusted with it, right? We've all heard the saying, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. We've heard it. We set it and built political philosophies on it. It's not true. It's not true. You know how I know that? God has absolute power and He's incorruptible. See, absolute power doesn't actually corrupt absolutely, absolute power reveals absolutely. When we get the power to do what we want or to force others, to coerce others into doing what we want them to do, it reveals the hearts that are inside of us. And too often in this world, when people's power outpaces their character, they start to use it to oppress people rather than serve people. And we make the mistake of looking at that and thinking that somehow it was the power that corrupted them. When in fact, it was just that power and that ability to coerce people that revealed a heart that was rotten and corrupt and selfish to begin with. The power just allowed it to boil over in a way that oppressed people. If Jesus had absolute power, the apostle, he didn't consider that that's something to be used to his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself. He made himself nothing. He poured himself out. He said, all right, God, I have absolute power. I can keep living this God-shaped life. But I'm, I'm willing to be poured out of that. Just empty me of that. And empty me out of that into the shape of the vision that you have for my life. He humbled himself. And understand, sometimes we use that phrase, humbled himself. Or, or I was humbled, as this phrase or, that it describes like a, a really embarrassing moment in our lives. Like, oh, I, I was really humbling. I got really humbled by that. That's not what we're talking about with Jesus. This isn't something embarrassing that happened to him. It's a choice that he made. It's a choice that he made to say, God, pour me out into the shape of the life that you have for me. I'm willing to be empty. And he made that choice, and he invites us, every single one of us, to make that same choice. Say, okay, God, I, I, I'm willing to have a different picture of what success looks like. I'm willing to have a different picture of what greatness really looks like. I'm willing to be emptied out of the vision that I have for my own life into the vision that you have for my life. And as Jesus did that, here, here's what it looked like. Try and picture this in your mind. It's an early spring evening in Jerusalem. 
the time has come for the people of Israel to gather and celebrate the Passover. So Jesus sends a couple of his disciples ahead to prepare uh, a room so that they can celebrate it together. And all the disciples have been there waiting for Jesus to get there. They're excited for when the rabbi will show up and kick off the Passover meal. There's 12 of them. They're sitting around the table. And then Jesus finally shows up and they're ready for him to, to thank God for the food and then begin eating. But he doesn't do that. Instead, he walks over to the corner of the room. This basin is full of water. And he ties a towel around his waist. And then he comes back to the table where the 12 of them are sitting. And they're, they're trying to figure out what in the world is going on. What in the world could Jesus be doing right now? And then he kneels down. And he starts to wash their feet. Like they're grimy, gross, disgusting mud and then newer covered feet. He dips them in the basin and he starts to clean them off with the towel. They can barely comprehend the fact that, that Jesus is doing this for them. There's something inside of them is, is, is breaking. There's this dissonance inside of them. This isn't right. And finally, Jesus gets to Peter. And Peter vocalizes what all of them are saying. He says, No. This is not right. I don't deserve to have you washing my feet like I should be washing yours. This isn't right. You can't do that. There's nothing in me that's worthy of you washing my feet. Jesus, stop. Don't do it. And Jesus looks up at this fear. Unless I wash you, you have no part of me. And right here, Peter still doesn't get it all. He begins to get it. So he looks at Jesus and says, Lord, then not just my feet, but my whole body. I think Jesus smiled as he was down to watch Peter's feet. He smiled. He thought, he would say, because Peter wasn't ready for this thought yet. <coughs> but he knelt down to wash his feet and smiled and said, Oh, Peter, tonight I wash your feet. On Friday, I wash your soul. See, tonight the outside is going to be clean, but I came to cleanse the inside. I came to be made whole. If you're here this morning and you've never put your faith in, you might believe that my purpose up here is to convince you that you ought to serve Jesus. And even some of you have been walking with the Lord for a long time. You've been going to church for a long time, going through the motions of faith for a long time. You might believe that my purpose here is to convince you to serve Jesus, but I want you to understand that's step two. That's step two of the Christian life. It's not, that's not really what I'm trying to do here. Step one is allowing Jesus to serve you. Step one is coming to this place that Peter came to as he looked at the creator of the universe, kneeling there, washing his filthy feet, and realized that I don't deserve this. Step one is coming to this place inside of ourselves where we can, where we can look at ourselves really honestly and say, I'm filled inside. I'm so shattered and I'm so broken inside and there's nothing I can do to clean myself. There's nothing I can do. I'm hopeless on my own. I can't earn it, I can't deserve it, but the blood that Jesus Christ shed when he died on the cross for me is sufficient. It's sufficient to clean you, it's sufficient to save you. Step one is allowing Jesus to serve you. If you can't do it, if you can't admit that you can't do it on your own, you need Christ, then you can have no part of it. That's what he says. Serving him is just our feeble response. Our imperfect response to him first serving us. But he did. He came and he died. And because he did, the last became first. And he was exalted to the highest place. Remember we're reading in Philippians chapter 2 about how Christ humbled himself. How he became nothing. How he emptied himself and was poured out. And this is what happened afterwards. Paul continues in verses 9 through 11, right? Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. You want glory, you want honor, you want greatness and meaning and significance. The only way to get there is the path of humility. It's not the easiest path, but it's Jesus' path. It's the path that echoes with the character of God and takes us places where he's at work in our If you want to live a life that matters, a life that makes a difference, then you've got to be willing to choose a life where Jesus is at the center and not you. If you want true success and significance, you've got to be willing to choose humility to the point of kenosis. Humility to the point of being empty. 
of coming to God and saying, look, I don't deserve what you did for me. I never, ever will God willing. Because I know that this is who you are, this is who you created me to be. I'm willing to let you pour me out, out of the shape of my life, into the shape of the vision that you have for me. Will you empty yourself today? There might be some of you here who are convinced it doesn't really make a difference whether you do or whether you don't. Like you look at your life and realize that this path of humility is so far and so opposite the path that you've been walking and the way that you've been living, the way that you've been pursuing greatness and success, that you're just basically too far gone. Too far gone to make a difference, too far gone for it to matter now if you start living like this, too messed up for God to use you. Or maybe you just feel worthless. Maybe you got to that point where you just feel depressed and deep down you're convinced that you're so broken and so messed up that God can't possibly use you. I want you to understand, like, coming to that conclusion that you're too jacked up to use, and you're just, you're just too broken, that's not humility. That's self-deprecation. The great writer and thinker C.S. Lewis once wrote, humility isn't thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. And there might be some of us here this morning who have had the dreams of greatness and the hopes and the visions of becoming world changers that we once had shrivel up and die inside of us because we don't believe that we're worthy of living a life of honor that changes the world. When I was 17, I went to a youth conference in Chicago. It was about how to share your faith. It was called SEM, and we stayed at Wheaton, and then every day we'd go downtown and do like street evangelism and, and share the gospel with with people around us. And every day we'd get on the buses or the trains to go back to Wheaton and people would have these amazing stories of like how many people they prayed with to receive Christ. And by the end of the week, my friend Josh had prayed with like eight people to receive Jesus and my sister had prayed with like four and I had zero. Like I was on zero. I was the worst evangelist at the, at the entire conference. And on the last I was feeling a little depressed but I was like, oh my goodness, I'm terrible at this. I'm highly unqualified to tell people about Jesus. Now, I was pretty convinced of that. And then the, the, the last night of the conference, we're, we're worshiping. And in the middle of, of singing worship song, I felt like God told me, I want you to be a pastor. And I stood up and I walked out and I sat on the steps of that building and, and it was raining a little bit and I just told them, you are terrible at math and you got the wrong guy. Like, you did I, like, you need a basic arithmetic lesson because I'm on zero and I'm the least qualified person in that building to tell anybody about you. I tried for a week. I stink. Or maybe you don't need basic math. Maybe you need geometry. You meant to beam it down to Josh. We were standing really close and he's good and not me. And what I didn't get in the moment, the reason that I'll never forget it my whole life, I'll never forget that moment, is to is this like God loves zeros? God loves zeros. He actually seeks them out. He did it once. He does it all the time. He loves looking for unqualified people so that he can call them out and equip them to the vision that he has for their life so that everybody knows if something big happens, it was because God moved and not because that person was great. And like let's let's throw it out there right now. If something big and something great ever happens at Provision Church. This morning or ever. It's not because of the zero standing on the stage. It's because God is awesome and God moved. He loves using zeros. The word humility comes from this, this Latin word. The root is humus. It means earth. Dirt. Isn't that amazing? I, I love it. I love that God uses this most lowly and common material and shapes it into something that he can use to change the world for his glory. You cannot be too low or too dirty to be used by God. You can only be too proud. So I want to challenge you this week. I want to challenge you to be more fully alive and more fully human, to start your journey towards greatness and success and significance, and living a life that changes the world by doing three things. Number one is to walk out of here and consider no person beneath you. 
If no person was beneath the God of the universe coming and deciding he was going to serve and humble himself, be poured out, and give his life for on a cross, if no person was beneath him, then no person that ever walked this planet is beneath you. So specifically, I want to challenge you this week to find somebody that you don't respect, somebody in your world who you would normally avoid if you could. I want, to find, I want to challenge you to find a way to compliment that person and find a way to serve that person. I want to challenge you to consider no person with you. There's no person with you. The second thing I want to challenge you to do is to embrace the idea that no task is beneath you. If God could come to earth and he could wrap a towel around his waist and he could get down and he could wash the filthy feet of his disciples if, if no task was beneath Jesus Christ. There's not a task on this planet that is beneath you. And I know the objection that some of us have. Well, you know, I'm, I'm a boss now. I, I'm a leader. There's other people that do that for me. There's, there's other people or I'm the man of the house. I know that's a different person's role, a different person's job. I want to tell you this. Leading best is leading from the bottom. And servant leadership is the only kind. Servant leadership is the only kind. Ask Jesus. Look at his life. So if no task is beneath them, I want to challenge you this week to find a task that you would normally consider beneath you. Whether it's menial or whether it's dirty, I don't want you to do that. I want you to do it this week for the sake of the person that would have to do it if you did. The third thing I want to challenge you to do, and this, this is the big one, this is the heart of the matter, I want to challenge you to replace yourself with Jesus at the center of your life. To get off of your own agenda and to get on to his. To get rid of your pride and to get rid of the worldly understanding that, that arrogance and that trampling people is the way to success and is the way to be greatness that you desire. Just come to God and say, okay, pour me out. Empty me out of my comfort zone. Or empty me out of my comfort zone. Empty me out of my comfortable life. Empty me out of the vision that I have for life into the vision that you have so that I can change the world for your glory. I think if we don't do this, if we're not willing to turn the world's idea of success on its head and pursue it through humility, if we don't do it, we're going to miss out. We're going to spend our lives chasing glory and honor and success and significance and meaning and not finding them because they don't exist in the places that we're looking. And the world's going to miss out. The world's going to miss out as we abuse and use and overpower people for our own agendas and our own glory. But if we do, if we're willing to walk out of here this morning convinced that humility is greatness, that the bottom is the destination and not just a step along the journey, then the world will change. People's lives will change, and their eternities will be rewritten as they see Jesus Christ through us. When Christ came down, he exhibited an inhabitant of humility that literally changed the course of the history of the world. And believe it, when people see Jesus in you, even imperfectly, even in a messed up way, when people see Jesus in you, it still has that world-shaking life-changing.